The young man you see with me is Esau Bitai. He's a crew member in the Solomon Endeavour. The Solomon Endeavour is a Poland liner vessel. I work quite a lot in the Solomon Islands. He's uh, based in Noro. Noro's in the Western Province, a very, very remote area. Um, I like to think that he and me are colleagues. In fact, we are colleagues. I started my life like him with the act of catching fish. Our job feeds literally millions of people. The earnings we make help me raise my children, help him raise his children. We help our extended families. We use that to educate ourselves and hopefully that makes us better people. I like to think that my work supports his aspirations and his work supports mine. I was very, very lucky that I could start fishing at a time where I could use the earnings of my work to educate myself. And in time, work on those issues surrounding fishing. And the one I'd like to talk in particular today is the issue of compliance. You see, fisheries is in the cross path of a lot of very, very, very different fields. We start with science. Science is rules applied and structures applied to research. Law and enforcement, that is a massive issue in fisheries. And we're not talking about the size of the hook or if you need to have metal traces or not, or if your boy needs to have your phone number. We're talking about scenarios where a Taiwanese-owned vessel is flagged in Vanuatu, crewed by Indonesians, fishing in the Solomon Islands, and now loading in Fiji. Who rules apply when that happens? Trade. We talked a lot about trade, and trade is defined in a lot of ways by origin, because that defines the fees, the taxes, the levies that the trade implies. So whose fish is it in that scenario? Human rights. Does uh, Indonesian crew on a Korean fishing vessel ring a bell? Yeah, and it's just not on that. I was very lucky to work in Rome for the UN, and we estimated that around 10,000 fishermen died every year on the job, mostly unreported. That is a factor of three from the combined amount out of mining, forestry, and oil extraction. Who cares about the fishermen? Diplomacy, the fact that I can speak about a Taiwanese vessel flagged in, the, in Vanuatu fishing around the Pacific implies that there are a lot of rules around diplomacy. Furthermore, you deal with Taiwan, China will have something to say and it will put a lot of extra rules around you. Public policy, we catch migrating fish. Who gets the benefits of it? Economics, just if you were to own that fish around the Pacific Islands, who gets it? Furthermore, subsidies. A lot of the fleets we have are subsidized to be here. And finally, public health. Because once I get my fish on deck, it's not fish anymore, it's food. And all the food rules apply. We do need to wash our hands. So the key element that I've been working for the last few years, and this, what I would say before, is only on the legal side of fishing. <laughs> the key element where I've been working for the last few years is the issue of illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing as an element of compliance. You see, if we, for each fish caught, we could answer to those very simple questions in a verifiable and legal way, <laughs> then it would be fantastic. You see, we see who caught it, where it caught it, in, one quant in what quantity, when and how. However, that's not always too easy. 
we need to understand as well that it's a cultural component to illegality. Compliance. We, we were to measure, and this is what we've done in the UN, we were to measure the regulatory elements of compliance versus, so what is illegal fishing versus transparency at the bottom, we have a linear correlation. The more transparency in the country in terms of governability, the less uh, illegal fishing. How come I finish working on compliance? You see, I must still see myself as an outsider most of my life. I'm a fisherman. Yeah. I don't, never had this, and I grew up, you may not know this, but I'm an, an immigrant. <laughs> I grew up in a, in a part of the world that, let's say, doesn't have the ultimate respect for a, for a culture of compliance. So, personally, I always thought there was a lot of rules that were pretty dumb. But at least I expected those rules to be applied for everyone the same. I migrated to this country over 20 years ago, mostly because I had the feeling that I wouldn't develop as much as I wanted in a culture that was selective towards to who the rules apply. When I was working on the vessel, I was talking to Esau. You see, before we left, the Bank of the South Pacific opened the first branch in Noro. And we had an ATM. So as is, you know, I remember the first time I was in front of an ATM. I was like, wow. You know. So I was talking to Esau and Esau was asking me, so how that work, how that that one works? And it's like, well, you know, it's not it's not it's not money what goes around, it's data. You see? You make a deposit that gets coded into the system, we know how much money there is, and then every time you make an extraction, that is discounted until you run out of money. And then you cannot take any more. In fact, the system has the capacity to identify when and where those extractions were made. Well, that's kind of cool. Then, when came, I came back, and uh, one day, maybe a week later, I still remember the moment I was uh, in Palm Beach, waiting for waves. Yes, we do have waves in WSF, and we have surfers in, 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 in Waiheke. It's just we have to be patient, you know. But I was just sitting there waiting for my wave, and I started thinking, would that work if we were to use a similar system to our issue of compliance, the issue around illegal fishing? And I cannot even believe I'm saying this, but I started to look for inspiration on banking and logistics <laughs> and finance. You see, and I started talking, and I spent the last two years talking a lot of fish with the guys behind the databases of the system. And we managed to come up with something we call fisheries information systems. When we do fisheries information system, stop there, at this stage, we have quite a good capacity of remote sensing vessels. We have what we call a vessel monitoring system, which is through satellites, and we have the capacity to know where, when, and who that vessel is. At the same time, more and more, we have the capacity of e-reporting. We have government-paid observers on the vessels. At the moment, in the Pacific, for per seining, which is one type of vessel, our coverage is 100%. So through a mechanism of the United Nations called the port state measures, ports have the capacity to not offer services to vessels that have fish being suspected of being caught illegally. And here's a key element. You see, illegal fish doesn't become illegal during the processing. In the factories, illegal fish is caught and landed illegally. So if we were able to stop that fish before it's landed, big step is made. So if not, the next change we did here is that instead of we proving, and I say we because I train a lot of fisheries inspectors, proving that their fish was illegal, what about they proving to us that the fish was legal? 
So if there is doubts, we let them come in. But we need to have a chat, a bit of a talk. <laughs> Once that is done, then the unloading is allowed. So, so far we got the when, the where, the how, and the who. So now the next step is the how much. A lot of the estimations done on board today are very, very accurate. But you see, we fishermen, you know, we get paid for the fish we catch. So it really, you would really know how much fish was caught, follow the money, follow the figures that make who pays and who get paid. Now, those figures have two very interesting components. One is that allows us to know how much fish was really caught. That has a very, very important element through the science bit. But secondly, because we talk about money, you all hear about laundering money. Same happens with fish. Illegal fish gets laundered through legal fish. The same way illegal money gets laundered through legal money. So if this initial landing of fish was to be able to code it through what we call a unloading authorization code, which is a traceable element that we can follow through the system, that becomes pretty much like the initial deposit. And each of the species become like a different currency into that deposit. So by having that initial number there, that initial system, we actually can later on use that to follow up in the same way a bank will do what happened to that fish. Some fish may go straight into carriers and be go to the system whole. But other fish may go through canneries, for example. And in those canneries, they will receive 40 tons of fish. Yeah? And other ones, and another different time, doesn't happen all at once, could go through loins. Now, some of the fish can go straight to the system, and we account before it leaves. Now, if you do cans, then 40 tons will become approximately, approximately 20 tons. So, hmm, hey, that's what you do when you exchange money. So you can go somewhere and take money of your own currency and exchange it to the local currency. So the, the, the tools were there already. So, yay. So we applied that system there, and the same for cans. Now, what we do at the end is to make sure that every movement through the system gets accounted the same way your bank did. Therefore, before the fish is allowed to be traded, if exported or sold, what we do is we make sure that we have a system of approvals and a structure of mass balance. Where the 120 tons originally caught are the same at the end. So if there is more fish that you want to take out of the system than the one that you deposit, something is not working. And then the inspectors will go and have a look on what you say. Now, the problem we have is that we always deal with issues of own compliance around elements of enforcement. Yeah? But enforcement is always limited by the capacity and the resources applied to enforcement, plus the value of the enforcers. And as we've seen, the value of the enforcers varied through the system. So for me, when I started with this process, was I wanted to have some fresh thinking. And what I liked from this one, it was that there is no interpretations. It's about mass balance. It's about a system that people will understand. It's about fish in, fish out. I like to think that the fairness of the system was really back to my core, why I left and why I work in fisheries. It's about the fairness of the elements. Now, this system, we don't have the money that the banks have, so as you imagine, this is just a minimal representation of reality. Behind this is incredible amount of work, pretty much like behind this event. Now, we don't have the money that the banks have, so I've been doing this work um, 
through a very small organization called the Pacific Island Fisheries Forum Agency, which are based in Honiara, with the economic support of the European Union. Last year, WWF took the concept and they presented to the US Presidential Task Force against IUU fishing. Sounds very impressive. And now, in July, I'm off to Rome because the UN is making uh, expert consultation on how to use this system through what they call technical guidelines for all the countries. So the, the process is gaining momentum. Now, the interesting thing for me is that why do I feel a bit cramped inside? You know, I'm very proud of the job I do, and I like the fairness, and I like to think that this system is helping ESAO's people. But if this is so fair, why ESAO's people are in the small boats? They are the legal owners of the fish. You see, what happened to me is as well is that I'm also internally always combusted about this idea because the world I live is not a world of really much great ideas. You see, I'm very lucky. I live in this beautiful island yep, in a fair, straight, transparent society. But the place I work is not like that. The place I work is not a place of ideas. The place I work is a place of food on the table. So, <sighs> 20 percent of the people I work with lives underneath this dollar coin a day. If I was to duplicate that, yeah, half a coffee, this is 50% of the world population. This is the world where my mom lives until she was a teenager. This is the world where a lot of Esau's people live. If we were to make this, this is 80% of the world population. This is the place where I live until I came to New Zealand. This is the place where Esau lives. This is a place where a thousand people like I know, like Esau, my colleagues, live. So that leaves you here. I know how much you pay to be here. So we here are the ones that are lucky. We can think about the future. So what I care about the fairness of the system What I care about the sense of fairness that my little contribution of work can do. I really need to think th deep if ESA actually needs my work. Or what he needs really is a better present before we can provide a more sustainable future. Thank you.